Good morning, church. I want to welcome you to our Sunday virtual service as we gather together virtually. Let's come to the Lord who delights in our presence. And as we sing to him, his delight increases more. Let's sing to him. We are here for you. Let our praise be your welcome.
one that I don't think we will come close to plumbing its depth and understanding uh, God's grace in our lives. And uh, I pray that even through the service we would get an idea or a better idea or an uh, even greater idea than we've had of what His grace uh, means to us and how it functions in our lives. Our responsive reading today is taken from the 22nd Psalm, and uh, I'd like for us to read it responsibly from verses 23 to 31. And uh, would you stand with me, if you're able, as we read it together? Praise the Lord, all who fear Him. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. For royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all the nations. Bow before him, all who are mortal, all whose lives will end as dust. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. This is the word of God for us, the people 
of God. You may now be seated or take on whatever posture you need as we look to the Lord in prayer. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, how good it is for us to come together and uh, worship you, albeit from different homes uh, from all over, Master. We, though, congregate in one heart and one mind to worship you, to hear from you, and uh, to be able to walk in your paths. We thank you that even as we come, we come acknowledging that you are a God who is worthy of every praise that we can offer. As the psalmist, uh, as the songwriter says, uh, if the oceans were filled with ink, it would not uh, have enough ink to be able to write all of the things that uh, you have done for us. Truly, Lord, you have been so magnificent in our lives, sustaining us, shaping us, molding us, carrying us, giving us wisdom, strength, helping us through our weaknesses. And in every situation, Lord, you offer your perspective, your presence, uh, your words, everything, Master, you give to us to help us to navigate through the challenges of this world. And Lord, as we come together on this day to celebrate you, to even invite you to look at our hearts, our lives, and see if there are things that are inconsistent with your holy will for us, we ask that you would do so. Show us those areas so that we may quickly uh, confess them and invite your forgiveness and cleansing in our lives. And Lord, as we listen to your word, anoint it with the power of your spirit and connect it, Lord, with every one of us that uh, at the end of it, we would have heard your voice and we would have responded to your will. We ask all this, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. As we continue to worship the Lord Church, let's look to the cross this morning. It is at the cross that justice and mercy came together. Jesus died so that we might live. Let's join our hearts and worship him this morning. Jesus Christ, I think about your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I wondered at this gift of
Shall we lift our offerings to the Lord? Almighty God, you have sustained us through this week. You have provided for 
all our needs and even more than that. And we pray that as we give back this offering, which represents just a fraction, Lord, of all that you have blessed us with, that your hand of blessing would be upon it and upon each one who has given. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Our text for today's meditation comes from the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to John, reading from verses 1 down to verse 11. John chapter 8, 1 to 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery, in the very act. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman, where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we are transported as it were to this courtyard, seeing you teach, seeing you being intruded by this group, seeing you deal with this woman. And Lord, inviting you today to speak to our own hearts and show us, Lord, what lesson we can learn from your interaction with this woman. We are open, Lord. Speak, Lord, through your spirit, we ask in your name. Amen. F. B. Meyer once remarked, it is, a ter it is a terrible thing for a sinner to fall into the hands of his fellow sinners. It is a terrible thing for a sinner to fall into the hands of his fellow sinners. Our text this morning kind of contains one of the more famous statements of Jesus. Quote, Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. End quote. And we have heard this phrase used very often, not just in a Bible passage or in an expounding uh, this particular uh, passage, but among various people also over the last couple of centuries where people have uh, got involved in some kind of sin and uh, this statement has popped up. But I read somewhere that this particular encounter that Jesus has with this woman is uh, almost akin to the 
the prodigal son. And so a few have called this the prodigal daughter. Uh, because it kind of uh, brings out a passage of scripture found in John chapter uh, 1 verse 17. Where it says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And, and as we look at this passage, we see both, isn't it? We see the law, the law of Moses finding its way into this encounter. And we see that uh, truth was in no way diluted, but grace was wonderfully amplified, magnified, and offered. I'd like for us to just take these verses, maybe two, three at a time, and see uh, what they have to offer us. The danger of this particular passage sometimes is that we uh, tend to leave it in the Bible, that uh, we look at it, we see the way Jesus handled it, and then we marvel at uh, the way he uh, handled the scribes and Pharisees and this woman, and we walk away with a greater appreciation of who Jesus is. And, and that's one way of looking at it. The Bible has just such profundity attached to it all over that we can take any passage and, and almost get nuggets that we never saw before. So today I want us to just look at this passage and then ask ourselves whether somehow God is speaking to us through it. God is speaking to you, to me, through these words found in John chapter 8. So, let's just look at the first three verses. That's the beginning. It says, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. He went back into the temple, and all the people, they've been hanging on to his every word, they marveled at the just the wisdom and the truth that he has expounded. And so they are back again in the morning ready to hear from him. And then suddenly this little teaching session is interrupted by a commotion of rustling robes and uh, the, maybe the dragging sound of feet that are so reluctant to be coming towards the master. Verse 3 says, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center of the court. In other words, they placed her in the very center. A public square, Jesus was there, there were many people and then they bring this woman and place her there in the center of the square. Who are the men? Bible tells us scribes and Pharisees, the religious people of that time. These were people who understood the law. These were people who expounded it. They were the ones who explained it to people, common people as it were, who couldn't understand it. They were the ones who brought this woman. Who was the woman? We don't know. It just refers to this woman as one caught in adultery. No name, no nothing about her. How do they catch her? Well, verse 4 tells us that they caught her in the very act of adultery. In the very act of adultery. The other question that we often ask when we read this passage, of course, is where is the man? Right? It takes two people to, to have an adulterous engagement. Where was the man? 
and this account tells us that they didn't bother bringing him. Even though they caught her in the quote-unquote act of adultery, which means that he was there, they didn't bother to bring him as well. And it just raises many red flags about their motive, isn't it? Which will become very clear as we look at the next couple of verses. So, they intended to expose her publicly to Jesus, which is why they brought her into the temple in the midst of the square and kept her in the very center of the square. Now, when we look at verse 4, 5 and 6 or 6a, they say to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act, caught in adultery in the very act. And then they remind Jesus what the law of Moses says. They say, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? Now comes the motive, verse 6. They were saying this, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. Testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. Now, therefore, it means that this woman happened to be just a pawn in this entire setup to bring Jesus into some kind of a conflict with certain stands that he may have taken or the, the compassion, the mercy that he had been showing to people all around. Le Leviticus 20.10 and Deuteronomy 22.22 says that both parties were to be put to death. That was what the law was and that was why they were bringing her to him. Now, the dilemma was this. If he said she should be put to death, he might be, I say might be, seen as rebellious to Rome since the Jews did not have the right to capital punishment. If you remember, that was why Pilate had to agree to Jesus' crucifixion. I said might be seen because we also read later in Acts that Stephen was stoned to death. So there's a little bit of uh, maybe confusion about where and what they were allowed to do. But if he said she should not be put to death, that would appear to be a violation of the Old Testament and would put him at odds with Moses. And either way, he would be in trouble. At least that was their thinking. Because if, if he didn't go with the law and went with mercy, then he was putting aside the law. And they were trying to see whether the law and mercy and compassion that Jesus was showing could be side by side. Whether you could have one and still have the other. An important kind of distinction, isn't it? To bring. And that was the test. So they brought this woman, caught in adultery. The law of Moses said stone her and the, the guy presented to Jesus. What do you say we should do? Let's have your opinion on this. Well, if we look at the end of verse 6, it says, but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Verse 7, but when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. So Jesus' response to this 
confrontation by the scribes and Pharisees initially was to ignore them. He just bent down and he began to write something in the sand. What did he write? I've read so many accounts of people speculating about all the things he wrote, but it ends up mere speculation, isn't it? Because it doesn't tell us. So let's not spend any time on that. But there's a more important question here. What did he write? Not important. What did he say? Very, very important. What did he say? If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. If there's anyone here without sin, throw the first stone at her. I suspect that this time the exodus was a little more quiet. It was more with shuffling feet, people just trying to find their way out without drawing attention to themselves. It says it started with those who were older until there was nobody left except the woman standing where they had kept her in the center of the court. Somehow that plan that they had to test him had fallen. They came out the loser from it. They came to trap him and they had to find quiet ways to disappear from that crowd until there was nobody left but her. And then in verses 10 and 11 we see Jesus' perspective of this whole sordid episode. Because Jesus looks up in verse 10, straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And it seems as if Jesus is putting this whole uh, encounter in perspective for what it really was. And it seems to be that Jesus looks at it through the lens of condemnation. That he saw this woman being condemned because he asked the question, is there no one left to condemn you? What is condemnation, beloved? Well, the dictionary would give us these two. It's the expression of very strong disapproval. And we saw that, isn't it? There was great disapproval. We caught this woman in the very act committing adultery. What do you have to say? As disapproving as you can get a, a censure or the action of condemning someone to punishment or sentencing, which was also present, isn't it? They condemned her to the point where they said the law of Moses says to stone her. The punishment was also being brought up. And Jesus puts all of this into perspective. They came to trap him, but he brought out their thinking in the way they were looking at this individual caught in sin. That there was condemnation that was being placed upon this woman. And it seems like Jesus was not going to allow that condemnation to take place. And so when he asks that question and tells them, or rather tells them that the one who is without sin, throw the first stone. You want to punish her? Go ahead. But you cannot have sin. Then they all go away. There's no one left 
to condemn her, to mete out this punishment or to show her disapproval. How do we know that? Because Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Although he was the only one who could have, because he was the only one there without sin. But he says, even I don't condemn you. But go and sin no more. I'm not in any way saying that your lifestyle is okay. It's a sinful lifestyle. Stop it. It's not right. But I will not condemn you. I will not condemn you. That's a interesting place, isn't it, for Jesus to kind of bring this whole conversation to, that it comes down to the condemnation of a sinner. And I thought about this for sometimes thinking, why is this so important for Jesus to remove the condemnation? Why is it so important? Why is condemnation so so center to this episode that Jesus says, even I am not going to condemn you. But go and stop sinning. That's a different issue and I'm addressing that. Stop sinning. But I'm not going to condemn you. Well, I wonder whether you've been under condemnation. It's not a very good place to be, isn't it? Because when we are under condemnation, we come under intense disapproval. There's conversations that go on about us could be justified, maybe not. And maybe even punishment is being meted out to you. And maybe too you're guilty of what you're being accused of, but the way that things are being handled by people around you is unfair. And all this just to say, maybe you know what it feels like to be condemned by people. I think there's a an even greater if I can I shouldn't use the word greater there's an even um, more intense kind of condemnation that comes because the whole area of condemnation is what Satan uses. Satan uses condemnation to neutralize who you are, beloved, as a child of God. Because he will bring this whole area that you are being accused of, something that you indulged in, fell into, and he will bring it up time and time again, every time you want to get past it, he will bring it up and keep it there right in the center and say, you, you want to do something good? You want to follow God? You want to do something righteous? Have you forgotten who you are? What kind of a person you are? And pretty soon, under this condemnation from the evil one, we just crumble and crawl into a little hole and we stay there. Unable to fulfill the plans and purposes that God has placed in your life and mine. 
That's what condemnation can do. It can force you to be somebody who you are not meant to be. Under the weight of this sin. But Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Could he be saying that to you, to me, today? Looking at what we could have done and saying, neither do I condemn you? You know, beloved, if you're a child of God today, if you bear his name, the Bible tells us that there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, chapter, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. No condemnation. And so Jesus would, in fact, tell you, you're my child, and I'm not to, not going to condemn you. I will bring conviction of sin to you. And conviction is just telling you that this was something wrong, and you ought not to do it. But go and sin no more. It's addressing the sin. And beloved, the only way to get out from under the weight of the accusation that the evil one can bring is to take this area that you have gotten caught in and bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, I have kept it from you for a long time. Not that you don't know it, but I have not confessed it. And sometimes, beloved, we carry some sin with us, isn't it? We may deal with others, but some sins which may be deep-rooted or happened a long time back or we find difficult or cannot be broken, we think, those we carry along. And those are the areas of condemnation that we find ourselves in, that is fertile ground for the evil one. And maybe today, what you need is for, just to be able to take it to the Lord, expose it to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I have sinned. I continue to sin. I want to stop. Will you help me? I am weighed down with the condemnation that I face day in and day out from the evil one. Free me. Free me. Your word says if I confess my sins, then you are faithful and you are just and you will forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I confess today. Forgive me. Cleanse me. And beloved, the weight of that condemnation then goes. And instead you will feel the embracing love of Jesus drawing you close to him. Saying, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. That's our word today, beloved. I'm not sure why God brought this to me. I was had turned in for the night a couple of nights back, I was lying in bed, and normally I follow the lectionary for my sermon passage. And as I was thinking about this sermon, this particular passage came to mind and I couldn't shake it. Felt very strongly that this is what needed to be preached.
And I believe that there are some who are listening, who are under a terrible weight of condemnation and who need to be freed. Dearly beloved, would you take that area? Maybe you're sorry for it, but you've never confessed to the Lord. Confess it to the Lord. Ask for His forgiveness. Get back that wonderful joy that comes from fellowship with Him. And be able to move out from under the condemnation that Satan may bring upon you. And let joy and peace, just the power of the Holy Spirit, cleansing, renewing, refreshing, pouring fresh energy and, and uh, vision into you. Enjoy that today, beloved, as we look to him in prayer, as we close. Therefore now, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus said. But go and sin no more. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, your word comes, Lord, to us both in a convicting and yet in a loving way. Convicting because it brings up to the fore those things that we have indulged in that is not at all consistent with your holiness. And loving because you don't condemn us, but draw us to the point where you will forgive when you hear us confess it and cleanse us and restore us to a beautiful fellowship with you, something that we may have missed for a long time. Restore unto us, Lord, the joy that could have been missing. And I pray, Lord, for those who are responding to you, bringing to you areas of darkness, of sin. Lord, would you wipe the slate clean? Would you forgive would you bring restoration, Lord, into our lives today? We ask this, Lord Jesus, in your beautiful, beautiful name. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Jesus is all the world to me. Isn't it? Let's sing this with all our heart, soul, strength and mind. Would you stand as we sing it together? i
standing for the benediction. Dearly beloved, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. God bless you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful week and we'll see you for the Wednesday Lenten Bible study at 8 o'clock. <laughs>